one of the, the key learnings that, uh, that I've personally taken away from the type of public-private partnerships that we've formed is, again, these perceptions or these stereotypes that we get into, either of the role that we play ourselves or the role that the other partners perceive that we should be playing. You know, just one, one case in point, uh, you know, as a technology company, as the company that's actually, you know, considered the birthplace of Silicon Valley, you know, there's, you know, a sense within HP of, oh, innovation, when we do these partnerships, the innovation is going to be flowing from HP's labs and HP's R&D to the government, to the NGOs. We're teaching these other partners, these other guys, about all of the great and, you know, the latest technologies. In fact, what we've seen time and time again is reverse innovation, where the needs are so dramatic and perhaps the resources or, you know, specific technologies aren't available or aren't working, connectivity or, you know, whatever issues. And so the innovation based on sort of, you know, limited resources or completely different needs, we've created applications, we've created products that were really driven in country by our NGO partners and have then been turned into commercial successes for HP. And that's been a, you know, a huge eye-opener for, again, the guys that are sitting in, in Silicon Valley thinking we're going to be teaching you know, our partners about how to innovate. It's actually going the other way around. And again, that's having direct benefit for the company, not only in terms of you know, development, but in terms of the business success. You know, an example, when we first sat down for the, for the first time uh, with the permanent secretary of uh, the health ministry at the time, Mark Bohr, you know, it's, it's, it's still so vivid for me that, you know, there were sort of the niceties, the pleasantries, the exchange of business cards, and uh, Secretary Boer said, you know, I really like HP. You guys make wonderful printers. And, you know, he went out of his way, taking 15 minutes to, you know, to show, see, you know, I'm not just saying this, you know, look at this printer on my desk, look at my secretary. You know, and it was like, great, you know, fantastic. But that was the only understanding that the permanent secretary had of HP. And in terms of the, the, the purchase decision making, the influence that the secretary had, HP wasn't even in the consideration set. Through the partnership, through you know, the, inf uh, the, the introduction, the referral, the partnership with Chai, not only did the permanent secretary, but the rest of the health ministry and other ministries in uh, the Kenyan government all of a sudden realized, oh, you guys actually can do the same sorts of things as Cisco and Accenture and IBM. Oh, wow, supply chain. You guys have the biggest supply chain in the IT industry. Can we maybe apply some of that expertise to how we get vaccines efficiently out into, uh, into the uh, local health clinics? So, you know, again, having the opportunity to build these types of partnerships completely changes, you know, those assumptions. And it's been, you know, mutually beneficial. I think that's what we've really learned, and that's what I've taken away from the partnerships is that you have to be very honest with yourself about what is the mission that you're all collectively signing up to? So what's the objective that you're all working together for? Why are you partnering in the first place? But then importantly, the concept of reciprocity. You know, what are you willing to contribute? What can you contribute? What are you willing to contribute? But then also, what are the expectations? What do you need back from the other partners and from the partnership in general? And I think what makes that possible is clarity of purpose, clarity of, of roles, and then the trust. Get uh, often asked, you know, so how does HP decide what are the partnerships that you want to form? And in a sort of tongue-in-cheek, I say, well, you know, we're a technology company and just like, you know, Google and Facebook and others, we've got some really, really sharp, you know, data guys that come up with an algorithm. And we just plug in information and boom, you know, it tells us what are the optimal partnerships that we should form. People sort of say, sounds sort of cool. It sounds really scientific. Can you share that with us? And then it's sort of like, well, the reality of the story is, yeah, there are some criteria that we think about, but so much of it, what we can't forget about is the importance of the relationships that you form, the trust, the openness, the dialogue that you have. It's not about a partnership, uh, you know, with an organization or a person 5,000 miles away and you get on a conference call or even on Skype. It's the time that you spend and the time that you invest personally in building the relationships, building the trust, 
because that, again, it reinforces that you're all aligned, you're working towards the common mission, and you're on the same team working towards that mission. So the trust in the personal relationships, I think for me, that's the overriding success factor in, in any type of partnership, whether it's a, a PPP or any other type, even personal relationships. It's the time you invest, the trust, the transparency that's built from that time that you build up. So I'm gonna tag team here and hand over to, uh, to Jackson to pick up that side of the story of how we went from two organizations that thought, let's, let's find a way to work together and how we started getting into it. Thanks, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes. So we hope we're not driving you to sleep this afternoon. Uh, so I'm just going to go back two years before that. I will not tell you what Chai has done or how it was constituted. Rich will do that for me as, as, as he gets on with his piece. Now, two years before that, at Chai, I'm, I'm just going to very quickly sort of put some color around the specific problem we are trying to solve. Two years before that, Rich and myself were out in the field. At that point in time, Chai was trying to address a specific, a very specific global health problem, which was uh, children with HIV did not have access to treatment. And more importantly, before they could have access to that treatment, they needed to be diagnosed. Uh, so in 2007, and, and the statistics were pretty clear, if, if you couldn't identify a child that had HIV pretty early, you would lose one in two by the age of two. Now, the issue was a little bit more complex. You couldn't use your, your standard methods of, of, of diagnosing HIV. Uh, human beings have understood how to identify uh, antibodies. That's how we test uh, an adult for HIV. We take your blood, we look for the HIV antibody in your blood, your body's response to, to, to the virus, and then we say by association that you have HIV. We can't do that for a child because a child acquires the mother's antibodies. So we needed to use, you know, sort of molecular science. Uh, the type of science we needed to do was only available from some private companies. We are, we are here talking about PPPs. So we jointly had spent tons of time working between the government, working between partners, convincing the, 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 the companies that we could actually have a test. So fast forward to 2009. We had worked so hard, worked across countries to sort of bring these diagnostics uh, you know, into the marketplace, to, to sort of bring them into the public health system which obviously meant working with very many people. Now, the specific challenge when, when, when we met with Paul was, was, was very basic. This science was fairly complex, so was only being done at central places within the country. So to put that into further context, so you have 2,000, 3,000 health facilities. You have to collect samples from children who you suspect have HIV, transfer those samples, package them appropriately according to the lab science that, that's been agreed upon, transfer them to three places or four places in a country, test them, and, and, and send this emergency test result back. Now, how do you do that, I mean, in, in, in our landscapes? I mean, you're, you're all going to Rwanda, to Burundi, to Uganda. You, I'm sure you have an appreciation of what the landscapes are like. And, and we began to think about, you know, how do we solve this problem? How, what, what collaborations can we have? So when Paul came and said, look, I have some money, yes, but we have expertise. We can, we can begin to work on this. So we began to look at, okay, what, what do we work with here? So some of you, for example, are, are going to be programming or, or working on health systems or information systems for the health system. So we began to ask ourselves, how do we do this? Short of hiring people, looking for money to write programs to like, you know, manage this logistical nightmare that is, you know, testing in a lab, you know, managing all those samples, getting test results out quickly for what is supposed to be an emergency test result. And, and we began to talk with HP and, and say, look, you know, technologically, what infrastructure do we need on the back end? What collaborations do we need to have 
So for example, we discover that instead of hiring people to sit in an office to write programs, we, we could actually work with a local university to where you know, students who ordinarily would write computer programs on a computer for purposes of uh, academic advancement could actually solve real public health problems. So that is what we began to work on. And, and soon we had this application that suddenly helped manage all the labs, could deliver all the test results back, could essentially provide a diagnosis in the public health system where testing wasn't occurring quickly enough, where you know, where, where we were not identifying children appropriately or where the program was failing more generally. Now, this work has grown, and I want to cut this story short. The, the important thing here to recognize is, you know, sometimes in, in, in global health, we, we raise money, as, as you will realize in the organizations that you work in. But we have a tendency to throw money at problems. We, for, we forget that we're working in a broad system. Uh, I believe, uh, and I hope that you believe this too, that you're an agent of change. You, you, you are an agent who will go into this broad system that constitutes many stakeholders, many actors. And your job is to catalyze that system. So fundamentally, I mean, as, as, as you try and solve uh, a certain public health system. You, you're only an individual, really. I mean, so, so the, the question is, how do you actually do that? How do you work as an actor? So I'm going to pause there and pass it over to Rich, and he's gonna talk about, you know, the perspectives that I've begun to talk about, you know, from the side of an NGO looking out and in partnership, and anything else that he wants to do. And Thanks. I have one question for him before he starts talking. Why would he move from the private sector to the public sector, like many of us are doing here, and then go back to the private sector. He's studying law. I don't know what he intends to do with the law. <laughs> you're gonna need a lawyer soon, <laughs> the way you're talking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it's great to be here this year again, um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know a little bit more about you guys as we have questions, so I'm gonna try really hard to be, to be concise. And maybe I'll sort of, since, since Jackson has uh, offered an invitation to make it a little more personal. I'll, I'll kind of back up a little further again and give you a sense of, and we've been working together on this program in Kenya and others like it uh, at Chai. I'm not a Chai anymore, but we started working together over eight years ago now. Yeah. So, you know, the, the processes that uh, Paul and Jackson have just shared with you about thinking through how do you deliver a service to a patient and not just, uh, you know, a task or a discrete project, uh, was sort of a description of where something really matured into. But when we started working together, so I came to Chai uh, having been a management consultant prior to that. Uh, and that was, my first, that was my first job out of college. And you know, I know that about roughly half or so of you are coming from business backgrounds, and roughly half or so of you are coming from more public health aligned backgrounds. And while we've spoken a lot about the benefits of working closely with the private sector, I also don't want you to think that we're like, feeding you a bunch of propaganda that's totally naive either. I mean, I think all of us have seen that all of these things are actually quite complex. And to be really personal and frank with you, so when I started that very first job out of college with my sort of brand new briefcase and flashy new tie and all dressed up and buttoned up and so excited to go to work my very first day, my very first client that I was assigned to, to consult for, within about 15 minutes of that first day of work was a company in the gun industry and I'm not casting any judgment whatsoever on those of you who may hold different views, but for me, that was one of the most challenging, personal, ethical things to ever be placed into. I mean, it was, I couldn't go running for the hills the first ugly thing I saw. I felt like I had to show that I was an employable person, but at the same time, it was, for me, it was just one of the most like unfortunate things that could befall me. And I was exposed to questions like, are the, could there be a market among children here that we've somehow overlooked? Let's think outside the box. And I just didn't share that enthusiasm. <laughs> so, you know, I, I started in that space, and, and, and I see why some of you who did sort of hesitate to raise your hands may be skeptical at times that there can be a conflict. But at the same time, I think it's really important for all of us who are working in, in the public sector space, and 
you know, as Jackson alluded to, I've, I've, I have moved back and forth uh, I, between private and public sector, uh, but have worked much more in the public and nonprofit sector. Uh, to also remember that there are a lot of problems there too, and a lot of the assumptions that for some of you, and I know a lot of you have already had exposure to this, but for some of you who may be stepping into that space, coming out of business and somewhat for the first time, making these partnerships work require a lot of effort and a lot of sort of really trying to cast away our prejudices on that side as well, because there can be just as many ugly problems working in an NGO as you might believe there could be in the private sector. And I think so often than not, many of us come from very privileged backgrounds we show up as a foreigner, we show up a different race than the place where we're working, we show up with representing uh, an organization, whether it's, in our case, the Clinton Foundation, whether it's Global Health Corps, whether, whoever. And, and you sort of are a steward of the reputation, the brand of that place, but that doesn't attach to you personally. And so many people will conflate those two things. And suddenly, you're riding through the streets of Kampala or Kigali or Lusaka and your SUV looking down on the street, you know, having enjoying access to privilege that you might not otherwise have. Somebody who's a nobody here suddenly has access to the halls of government there. And so sometimes the same privileges that we imagine will lead to abuse uh, in the private sector here, those same privileges are highly concentrated and oftentimes abused in, in the NGO sector too. And I think before we start really thinking about like, who to point the finger, who's gonna be the villain when you sit down to negotiate at the table? And you're gonna say, okay, I need this from this private company. And I'm representing this like public health initiative in this foreign country. Like kind of check some of your assumptions at the door because it's not so clear that when you sit down to negotiate that kind of partnership that you are representing the best faith, the cleanest side. And do your, I hope all of you are gonna do your part. It sounds, I know you're so well prepared here and sort of there's so much thinking about how can you make sure that you don't perpetuate a lot of those injustices that are happening in our own houses. Because as you advance in your career in public health, you know, looking outward at who is the enemy and what you might perceive as a, a real struggle in social justice to bring equity outside, within our own organizations there are inequalities all the time. You know, the person who's flying in from the US is suddenly promoted faster than your friend and colleague who sits at the desk next to you, you're compensated, two or three times better. You don't even sometimes question it yourself. And so I think really thinking about the business operations and the equities internally is so important before we start to assume that the person on the other side of the negotiating table is the bad one. And making sure that we start off a partnership by really sort of representing our own organizations as justly as we can. And part of it just means speaking out internally too uh, and really wondering why are you the one who is invited to sit down in the first place to negotiate with company XYZ when maybe the person who's sitting next to you, you know, and wherever you've been shipped off to was actually the better qualified one, but for all of these superficial reasons uh, and for the privileges that you bring with you, uh, the opportunity may have fallen to you, you know, speak out. So, you know, I think while we sort of move through all of these partnership questions and think about how to align objectives, it needs to be aligned on all sides. It's not just a matter of working with the companies. And so having stepped out of a space, you know, working with gun clients that asked about children <laughs> to stepping into some oftentimes equally, equally unattractive circumstances, not just with the organization, I'm not suggesting it's always just the organizations I worked with, but just to be in that space in that sector, to see that happening can be equally uh, disillusioning. And I think at the same time, you know, there are so many pieces of this that need to come together that it's even when there's a profit at stake, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna make sort of a grand apology for it, but sometimes it's so important that companies do make a profit. And I'm gonna, I wanna share with you a part of this story, sort of before we can even test the child, one of the things that we had to work on uh, at Chai was the availability of supplies. And at the time when Jackson and I first started working on infant diagnosis and we're dealing with this issue in Kenya and, and I think all of the countries where uh, Global Health Corps now works, there was, at that time, there was one manufacturer who made one of the most critical products in the supply chain. There had, all of the studies that had been done around what can you do to diagnose an infant exposed to HIV had been done using one particular kind of filter paper. And that piece of filter paper was somewhat of a commodity in the true sense of the word. I mean, it was kind of interchangeable. Lots of people make filter paper. 
but everybody had approved the products, the assay for testing, for use in countries using this one product. And that manufacturer didn't realize, in fact, that this one product was being used for that purpose, because it's used for a lot of different medical purposes. It wasn't profitable, and they decided to shut down uh, the plant that was making the product. And all of a sudden, at a time when we were supporting countries and over 20-something countries to diagnose infants with HIV, nobody could get this like key linchpin in the entire process. And it was, it was a scramble to figure out, to like look for, I mean, we were digging through warehouses in rural areas of every country left and right, trying to just see like what stockpile of this one filter paper can we find and redistribute and sit down and renegotiate with the company. And the conversations that our team had to have was to say, first to make them aware. And when this company realized they had no idea that their product was the only one approved for use to test infants with HIV anywhere in the world. First of all, they were like mortified that they had shut down the production. At the same time, we negotiated with them and said, okay, what's it gonna take? Because we don't want to negotiate a one-time uh, donation. What we need is, we need you to start producing this again. And we need you to actually produce it at enough of a profit that you know, the company continues to produce it sustainably so that we can rely on that as we build up these public health programs. And so it was an interesting case in this process where, I mean, Chai is so known for its uh, price agreements and all of the work that we do on price reductions, and that it was always uh, really the bread and butter and the core of it. But there are even circumstances where uh, negotiating the right price, wasn't, it wasn't always about just the savings there as well. It was about how do you find, how do you solve the market, where, when there's a market failure of some kind, how do you solve that and bring it into a better equilibrium for everyone? And, and ultimately, what you find in those circumstances of real crisis, I, in, in my experience, and I think all three of us share, is some of these distinctions between the private sector and the public sector and the NGO sector are just completely false. It's everybody sitting around the same table trying to solve the same problem. And there's a lot more fluidity between the, the sectors than it even seems. You know, somebody who used to be working in the government is now like the country head of some NGO. And, Somebody who used to work in the government got poached out of it for whatever reason by another company and now they're the ones you're negotiating with. And a lot of times the communities that are working together to solve these problems aren't as clearly defined as which sector they're sitting at the table representing because in this game of musical chairs and global health and development, development takes so long and so much time and such a long-term commitment that people change roles over time. But ultimately it's the people that solve the problems. And so regardless of whether it's you know, someone sitting at one on one side of the table or another, they're all really just trying to figure it out. So I'm just going to say one more thing. Uh, at the risk of taking this, extending it, and, and we really want you to engage us. We don't want you to think that, you know, we went into a country and suddenly solved a problem. It's, it's, it's really important to understand that what one has to do is to sell a vision. There has to be a very clear vision. So for example, if, if we're talking about this partnership, we're not gonna go and tell Paul, hey, you know what, we are saving babies, give us some pieces, give us some hardware, we're going to set it up in a country, we're going to send some SMSs and we'll get some children to come to the clinic. He needs to feel that he's part of a broader vision. Like, you know, there's, there's a certain injustice that we all need to address and we all have some role and our collective effort is way greater than our individual efforts. So likewise, I mean, when we began working on this problem, it was a major problem. I mean, Chai was and remains a very small organization in the global health space. I mean, we had a few hundred thousand dollars compared to, for example, you know, PEPFAR, Global Fund, the rest who have millions, if not billions of dollars. And, and, and we realized that if we were going to make this work in countries, we were not going to talk at the government, whether uh, in, in many ways Rich and myself are like the global health cause where you have one from America and one who's <laughs> local. I mean, yeah, the power of diversity. I mean, we, we were clear in our minds that the government needed to share this vision. It, it's really, uh, I mean, one of my, you know, sort of pet peeves is the recognition that it doesn't matter how much money I have, how smart I am, 
but you know or you know how a government official behaves whether he's corrupt i dare say uh, they have the mandate i have no mandate at all and unless i can empower and equip them to do their job right i'm doing nothing i'll just be throwing money at a problem as 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 i was saying earlier so it's really important to recognize and apply your role as an agent. You have to use your power of agency. You must share in a broader vision. And it must be clear to you. It must be clear to your government partners. It must be clear to your government's other partners and, and the private sector. Everyone has a role. There has to be an objective that's very clear. We needed to get over 200,000 children on treatment. Well, there were none in the world. And we really needed to go find them wherever they were. We had to figure out how to do it, and we could only do it collaboratively. So should I stop there and invite questions for us? Sam first. Hi. Um, I, I've actually had the opportunity to work as part of C uh, the Clint Global uh, Initiative as well as with the Kenyan Ministry of Health. And so huge shout out to both, both parts of that world. Um, they do, I think, really phenomenal, innovative work. Um, I'm curious. I, I know that one of the criticisms of, of public-private partnerships is, is you know, who's, who's making the money here and for wh what are the stakeholders and who's benefiting most from uh, appeasing those stakeholders. Um, my question is, how does risk play into how what companies can bring to the table or what um, innovative nonprofits can bring to the table when working with relatively conservative organizations like governments. So how does risk play into this? Yeah. Um, so, so the interesting thing in the in the model, and I'll start by thinking of you know how we we started working with the government and with with Chai, it was great. HP is going to donate the equipment for building the data centers. HP engineers are going to design that solution, implement it, and run it. Fantastic. So what do we do then after that? From really the beginning, we started looking at this of, you know, we can fly in solution architects, we can fly in the software developers, but you've got to be thinking sort of about the sustainability of the program and the fact that the, the company, you could have a change in CEO, you could have a company go bankrupt, and then if that's the lifeline, not only for the solution, but for the financing, you know, then what? So always thinking about who are the different players. And again, you know, is HP the best company to be financing everything? Or are there other uh, institutions, you know, foundations that that's their role, that's their key asset is the financing, even governments, USAID. So it's something that we were looking at from the equation up front. Now, we were lucky when we started this that because we had a board mandate, you know, we were sort of like a startup that had our first investment capital, but we still had, um, you know, a theory to prove that this was going beyond philanthropy, just, you know, transactional moving money and, and product to actually creating business value. So there was, you know, faith and trust that we laid out this proposition, but then we had to actually demonstrate that it was, that it was coming true. Um, as an example, we went from you know a few hundred thousand, you know, in, in some years maybe a million dollars in product, because of that transactional relationship where the government saw us as a printer maker and a laptop maker. We've been able to document that you know something on the order of thirty to fifty million dollars in business, incremental business is directly attributable to the relationships that we've built, the work that we've done. What many companies do when they launch a new product, a new solution, the early adopter, the first clients, you know, there will be steep discounting. You know, those clients are taking the risk. And that's sort of the approach that we've taken as well, that, you know, the risk to us is as we're trying to build business with a particular client, with a particular government or a country, you know, this isn't uh, a donation in a philanthropic sense. It's investment. It's business investment in terms of, uh, establishing our reputation, our, our commitment to a country, to a client, and then, you know, it's following on and saying, well, we need to see the business coming, you know, on the back of that as well. So there is a bit of a leap of faith, but just like any other uh, risk calculation in terms of an investment in a new product, in a new client, we're looking at the partnerships and the, and the projects that we do 
in the global health space sort of through that same lens. So you mentioned the innovations labs, and I really like that idea and this mutualistic role that um, is kind of created with that relationship. Yep. And I wanted to know, do you create opportunities for jobs to be developed out of that? Any use of local talent, um, like Kenyans or any other yep. um, nationals at the local level? Um, I feel like there's a, an opportunity for the local talent to be used. And what, do, what are your thoughts about HP creating jobs in those areas? Because once you create the technology, then you also create um, a disparity if you don't leave any room for the technology, um, uh, kind of the errors that are created. So in, in the spirit of not giving a man the fish, but teaching them how to fish, the whole idea was, was, was simple. I mean, the people who built the solutions were senior year, or junior year to senior year students. And the, we actively decided that we wouldn't be between them and the solution for whom it was intended or who, who you know, the government labs, the government people who owned the actual solution. So the students spent a lot of time in the public sector. And instead of saying, here are our jobs, we basically equipped them to have jobs that would allow them to work with the public sector. I mean, any of you who's worked in the private sector, in the IT field, you know that there are very few companies that know how to work with the public sector. I have not met any, uh, you know, working around. So we were very proud when we noticed that these students, as they left school, were actually getting jobs in places like the World Health Organization, you know, going to work for NGOs that were directly working on similar solutions with the government, etc. So we thought that the best point to sort of apply that impact was while they were still at school. But that's just one of the potential, potentially many solutions. We just thought that, you know, trying to create an innovations lab is not sufficient. We needed to have a set of problems that needed to be solved. We all have a finite life, and we all have to begin to sort of figure out solutions for the problems and the social injustices of the day. Um, question here? Sorry. Uh, um, so uh, in my experience, what I found is when uh, working with engineers, or uh, with people who are not from the social sciences or humanities, their approach to some um, issues is very different from how social scientists think about it. So wh while an engineer might say that, you know, if you fix this and everything will be fine, whereas a social scientist might say that there are so many other factors that you have to consider. So when I think about a public-private par partnership, do you face those kind of issues about ideology and? Uh, how do you um, figure that out between yourselves? I, n I know Rich has a, a very strong opinion on this as well, but I'd say short answer is yes. And you know, coming with those different perspectives, you know, at first it's, it's again down to a new partnership as you're building trust and understanding you know, a differing view can just, you know, it's like, you know, why in the world, you know, would we take the time, as an example, with developing the, the reporting dashboards? You know, I had some of our engineers and even some of our marketing people saying, why would we take the time and bear the risk of having computer science students developing some of the code and developing these dashboards for the government? What if they get it wrong? And besides, if we do that, you know, how do we show our expertise as a company that we know how to develop, uh, you know, software and applications? But then looking at it and seeing that again, you know, the client, uh, the health minister, I'd say arguably probably the biggest issue, the biggest success factor through his eyes was the fact that we were creating real world projects, real world opportunities for Kenyan students rather than parachuting in software engineers from somewhere in Europe or in California. And so again, stepping back and saying, we've got preconceived notions of, of you know, what the right or what the, the best solution is, but what are the assumptions that we build into that? Are there other 
are there alternative solutions that deliver different results for different purposes? And so I think, again, that's you've got to sort of put the brakes on the expediency of delivering results of thinking, you know, are there compromises that we make to get to a result that maybe delivers some uh, externalities, some positive externalities, as opposed to just doing the solution the quickest at the lowest price possible. You know, that's one, just a very specific example there too. One of the solutions for early infant diagnosis was uh, GSM equipped, or GSM chipset equipped uh, printers that in areas uh, in rural health clinics where you didn't necessarily have reliable access to the internet, now if you have a printer with a, you know, same chipset in your mobile phone and you can deliver results and have them printed out that way, you know, that's, getting the reliability factor for the test results getting to the, uh, to the local health clinics. One of the things that we did that now in retrospect was really stupid, we were thinking, well, there was a solution out there already. It cost about $700 a printer. You know, you can go down to, in the States, a Best Buy and get a, you know, a, uh, an inkjet printer for less than $100. And we actually, we had assumed that the low cost of the hardware was one of the important factors. And what we found now is that, well, the hardware was cheaper, but getting access to the inkjet cartridges, we would have been better off having done a laser jet printer, a more expensive piece of hardware, but with more reliable, you know, longer lasting toner cartridges than, you know, than the, uh, you know, the entry level inkjet uh, cartridges. So again, that's like, you know, you go, oh God, you know, if we had asked the right questions, and sometimes you don't know the right questions until, you know, you're, you're into uh, looking at hindsight, but you know, it's that type of issue of saying, you come to it with a certain set of assumptions, but you have to be willing to say, you know what, mea culpa, we got that one wrong. Part of innovation, and this is really important, as change agents, you guys are in a really unique situation where you have the opportunity, you have uh, the, the, the remit to fail. The key is, when you fail, learn from it and try not to make the same mistakes again. A lot of companies, a lot of organizations talk about innovation, but yet back to the question about risk, you know, say, oh, you know, we can't take risk, you know, we've got to minimize risk. If you're innovating, you're failing. If you're not failing, you're not innovating. And that's really important that you've got to be open to that and make sure that, uh, you know, your chain of command, your, your clients allow that latitude to make mistakes but learn from them and progress as a consequence. Hello. Um, you mentioned having an algorithm to find suitable partners. And uh, I was wondering what specifically attracts a private enterprise to a partner. If it's based on sustainability and um, you know, projected project results, in that case, is a private enterprise more likely to pick a short-term project to invest in because it might yield better results and quicker? We've had a lot of fun, <laughs> especially uh, the company going through a lot of organizational change and continuing to be under pressure in terms of financial results. When we first started the partnership, what was really interesting is calibrating expectations with our communications guys. Ultimately, we're talking about saving lives of children that are HIV positive. The time that it takes to move the needle to affect that change on, on a you know, on a country level, isn't weeks, isn't months, we're talking years. Communications teams in private sector at least tend to operate on, you know, a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly schedule. So within two months of officially announcing the partnership, I had communications colleagues that were already saying, okay, so, you know, next quarter and about three months from now, you know, we're thinking already about the headlines and, you know, what we want to announce about the success you know, what's gonna happen to the, the infant mortality rate in Kenya next, you know, next quarter? And it's like, you know, and I don't mean that as sort of disrespect or that, you know, my communications colleagues were ignorant, but it was just, again, a different context. What they're dealing with, the type of news cycles and the communications timelines, what we were doing was completely new. And so again, it's, you know, not sort of getting your back up and saying, God, these guys don't know anything understanding where they come from, being empathetic and saying, okay, let's rewind, step back, understand the program, understand the timelines and recalibrate to what you need to achieve 
uh, you need to be announcing something and showing progress. Let's talk about sort of operational milestones, but in terms of the health outcomes, you know, again, the vision, we're gonna be looking out, you know, a year from now, two years from now, what are we gonna be able to say about this? So the importance of, it, it is absolutely critical to understand that you need to have milestones and success factors and part of the decision around the EID program compared to some of the even bigger, sort of thornier, hairier challenges, said we think that we can make progress on this and show success. It's a big issue, but and there's a lot to do, but it's something that we can make some tangible progress on, and that sort of, that builds the trust, builds the buy-in of, you know, your executives, of all of your other stakeholders as well. Thank you. I would just add that I, I think capital moves through all of these organizations the same way. I, I don't know that the other sectors that we've been talking about are necessarily immune from that challenge. I think a lot of nonprofit groups make decisions on really short funding cycles too because they're also thinking about how to market what they succeeded at and how they're going to bring in the next grant. And sometimes they, you know, are just as likely to kind of market what happened. And now you're on the hook to deliver something even greater than that the next time around. And the disparity between what, what's really happening can drift apart in all of these sectors. I have a question over here. Over here. Um, it seems like a lot of pretty prominent or large philanthropic arms of organizations are moving overseas. Um, do you think that is the general trend, or do you think that's just kind of something that's happening, has happened and has stopped now? Um, and then kind of a follow-up to that, do you believe that that shift is leaving kind of a gap in funding for state-based NGOs that were depending upon these organizations before? Or is that really a not an issue? Rich or Jackson, do you want to focus? Focus, let me just yeah, sorry. repeat. Sorry. Um, yes. So I was just wondering if a lot of the philanthropic arms of organizations are moving overseas. Yeah. Um, it seems like that's a general trend, but I wasn't sure. And then I'm not sure, I don't really know a lot about this, but it would seem that that would sometimes potentially leave a gap in funding for United States-based organizations working in the States or working internationally that was being funded before. So now that funding has shifted away from to work directly with partners in the local countries. Um, is that the case or I'm just, I don't really know? I'll just quickly talk to HP specifically, and then you know maybe Jackson, if you want to touch to you know Chai and where funding is coming from. But you know one of the things we look at terms of you know established markets and growth markets, and that's not sort of you know say U.S. versus Kenya. It's not a you know quote unquote mature versus uh, a developing or emerging market, but more where is our installed base, where is our revenue coming from today versus what are, you know, what are the countries that, you know, we're, we're growing our revenue in. And what I see is that it's sort of a two-pronged strategy. You have sort of a finite uh, bag of resources and you need to make that decision of what do you do to establish, or sorry, not to establish, but to maintain, say, your share of wallet, your revenue in established markets, but then what are you going to invest, you know, as business development to grow? We very consciously looked at what we're doing for programming in the U.S. for global health uh, and sort of put that up against what we're doing in emerging markets. Um, a real interesting one was that one of our partnerships with uh, Partners in Health, we signed on and partnered to help Partners in Health develop uh, the teaching hospital in, in uh, central Haiti. And at the time, our chief marketing officer and even our CFO you know, were saying, we don't even have a direct presence in Haiti, you know, is that really strategic in the sense of this new business model? How are we helping our business by investing in a country that we have, you know, nominal to no, you know, revenue coming out of? And again, to the, the idea of a global economy, the hospitals that we were building and demonstrating our expertise in London, in New York, in Tokyo, was directly affected by the, the expertise that we were demonstrating in, in Haiti. Uh, we've got a number of um, you know, uh, prospective uh, projects now in London where that sort of innovation and working in you know, a resource constrained environment like central Haiti has demonstrated to these prospective clients, you guys don't just you know, talk theoretically about uh, innovation, you're actually doing it. So you know, looking at where the investments are coming but then where the benefit is arising is really important as well. So we're, you know, we, 
we do balance, there is a competition, but it's a recognition that you've got to play in both the, you know, say the US and other markets as well. I have a question over here. Um, I have another set of three Ps for you all. I'm wondering if any of you can speak to the Kenyan Ministry of Health's um, sort of priorities, processes, and perceptions of pub the public sector and how that may have impacted their involvement in this partnership. That's a really good question. You remember when I said about who the real stakeholder is? It's the government of the day, the, you know, the government that was elected by the people, the public officials appointed to work on these problems. You know, one of the things that one has to be very careful about is to figure out what the real priorities are. I mean, you, you're now getting into global health, and this is, and, and capital, you know, like in the private sector is allocated in an interesting way. Uh, you know, either money invested in countries is coming in because there are many patients in a specific country. So for example, in Kenya, you have over 600,000 people on treatment, you expect that you'll be diagnosing very many babies. So, you know, an NGO like Chai and others come in and say, we are going to work on this problem. But fundamentally, is that the issue the government sees? Uh, you know, they'll even say, look, malaria is a bigger killer than HIV, and you, and you want to deploy half a billion dollars solving a problem that is not even a problem that we can actually see. So let's just say that, you know, we, work, we were very careful about the approach. We were careful not to do anything that we felt that was important, that the government felt wasn't important at that specific point in time. And, 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 and these points to sustainability, do they actually need it? Is, you know, perhaps it's needed, perhaps on the balance of things it's needed, but do they actually need it today or are they focused elsewhere? We found ourselves actually solving spending, maybe even 70 or 80% of our time doing something completely different. You know, like just figuring out like patient flow in health facilities. Like, you know, they'll say, look, we, we don't understand how our health system works in this part of the country. Like Richard will tell you that he's been to places like Northern Cameroon, a place where you wouldn't go, you just basically be abducted, for example, today. But the government was like saying, look, we need to figure out what the health system looks like up there before we can make a decision on what we need to do today. So depending on who you are and, and your personal perspective, then you have some tough decisions to make irrespective of which organization you work for. Um, hello. So considering all these um, tough decisions that you've been talking about and just knowing who the true stakeholders are, I was just wondering if in coming up with your partnership, there was any kind of value redefinition where you had to say, okay, this is what HP stands for and this is what CHAI stands for and we want to work together, but um, do we have to change something about our organization was, or redefinition of goals? Um, and also, um, I was just going to ask if there's ever been a situation where some of the executives at HP would want to use your work with Chai or with partners in health for um, a commercial benefit and how you've dealt with that. Thank you. I'll take a first stab at it and then Paul, I'm sure can add. You know, one of the things Paul said first was sort of how the engagement started where HP sort of showed an interest and they were basically asked like, okay, great, how much money do you want to just give us? And I think that was part of that. To, I mean, that gets a little bit of your question of, how did the values start to align? And what actually started to happen was like Jackson and I and a few of us who were sort of really close to the work on the ground started having certain conversations with Paul and others from HP who were willing to come out and really take the time to see what was happening. And that had to filter back up. I mean, in a way, we sort of solved the value problem 
around understanding sort of normatively what did we all want to achieve by negotiating it at some unconventional points in the relationship and then had to each do our part to kind of educate others sort of who are more conventionally in the position of negotiating some of these arrangements after we had made more organic sort of contact around what do we care about and what are we trying to achieve and what are the values going to be. So I'll give two very specific examples. Um, Chai is, you know, is one of these great organizations that is also very humble. You don't see people from Chai going out and, you know, doing press releases about this is what we did. There's no bragging by Chai. A lot of bragging by other organizations that say what a wonderful job they're doing. But so coming from that point of view, you know, Chai, the, the Chai team sees that they're there as an agent of change and support to the government. And it's about, you know, getting on and, you know, getting the job done. Companies inherently need to be talking about what they're doing. And that was a real concern when we first announced the partnership. Uh, you know, our marketing and communications folks were saying, you know, well, you know, we need to announce this and we need to have the credibility. We need President Clinton, you know, to, to make a statement about, you know, why this partnership is important. And the first reaction from the media team at Chai was, you know, we don't do that. President Clinton doesn't make endorsements of companies, you know, thanks but no thanks. And we had to go through that, you know, very frank conversation about, you know, why, why is that important to HP? What are the consequences, though, in terms of you know, being seen as you know, favor, favoring HP o over other companies? And we had to work through that, and we wound up with a very amicable outcome of you know, raising profile of public-private partnerships and the importance of private sector companies getting involved in global health. And that, in turn, benefited not necessarily Chai directly, but Chai's mission and the governments that they're supporting. So again, it's like, you know, rather than sort of avoiding those awkward conversations, what's really important, and it comes from having the trust, is to say, listen, as partners, we have certain needs. This is why we have them. How can we get to some amicable or some, you know, mutually beneficial result that's not going to compromise principles or create conflicts of interest? And in terms of you know specifically on the uh, you know the commercial endorsements, it's like the 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 business has spoke or the the success of the project has sort of spoken for itself. That we haven't had to go and say you know try you know go and tell these commercial clients you know what what we've done. The results of the program have sort of demonstrated you know the benefit that we've been able to leverage commercially on its own. So. Ah. Oh wait. Okay. Last question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and thank you uh, specifically for emphasizing the role of uh, private companies and IT companies in particular uh, for utilizing their enormous resources and innovation capabilities uh, for global health outcomes. Um, and I was wondering, uh, when you're looking to form a new partnership, uh, to what extent and whether you are even able to negotiate intellectual property rights? And I wonder this because I know from what I've learned in the past, uh, for global health outcomes, it seems as though less strict intellectual property rights or copyright uh, laws, uh, they improve the accessibility of the various technologies for poorer hospitals, more rural areas, and even local companies. Whereas for the interests of the shareholders, particularly in IT companies, uh, loosening these standards may be risky and unprofitable. So how you go about, uh, I guess, negotiating these uh, sorts of issues? I'm going to do this one. I'm going to give you sort of the short version of this. It's almost like a case study in and of itself. And our legal guys at the start were taking this real hard line of, OK, any of our partners, any of the innovations, this is HP uh, you know, IP, and we need to protect it. The reality and the goodness is that technology is moving so quickly. And there's really a market embrace of open standards. And even HP has been you know, a leader over the last couple of decades in embracing sort of the standard building blocks of technology rather than proprietary systems. That's real goodness for sectors like global health, is that you're bringing more people in to innovate quicker. The real value that we see now with, with clients like uh, you know, public, uh, you know, public health sector, you know, ministries of health is, not so much, you know, do you have a technology that's proprietary, you know, even if it, you know, solves the most uh, pressing issues, but 
Do you know how to implement? Do you know how to actually solve the problems? So taking those building blocks and being really resourceful and figuring out how to solve problems, working in an open collaborative environment, trumps proprietary things. So. Okay, I feel terrible that we are cutting them off, but if everyone bats their lashes at Paul, he might stick around for a little while. I don't know if Rich and Jackson can. Um, thank you all three so much for joining us. I think this was very enlightening and shed a lot of light on great partnerships, so thank you so much.